Have you ever faced a setback so discouraging that you questioned whether it was even worth continuing on your journey? Perhaps you've asked yourself, why do these obstacles keep getting in my way? Or is it possible to turn this failure into some type of win? If so, you're not alone. Many people encounter challenges that seem to block their path to success. But what if those very setbacks were actually opportunities to, in disguise, waiting to be transformed as some type of stepping stone that may propel you forward? In today's episode of Coach's Corner, we'll dive into how you can turn setbacks into stepping stones for success. By the end of this conversation, you'll walk away with actionable solutions that will help you view challenges from a new perspective. Adapt with resilience and leverage your strength to achieve your goals. And as a special thank you for joining us, we've we've got, sorry, we've got a free gift for you, a guide that will empower you to take those first steps and keep pushing forward. Get ready to shift your mindset and turn obstacles into opportunities. I, I, I love the way we kind of started this show off because I really do believe that what we talked about set the conditions for what we're going to talk about. Because again, we were talking about the things. Well, I made mention of things and somehow we tend to take things and make those things like more important. So when it comes down to it for most of, for most of us, and I'll start that way, when it comes down to it, I, I wanna ask this question to kind of get us started to get the juices flowing. What are some closely held beliefs that some currently hold about failure that may be limiting their potential for growth and how can we reframe them? I think one, and I've heard it a many a lot of times is failure is a sign of weakness. You know, a lot of people think that <clears throat> when they fail, that it's a bad thing and that you're weak or that you're somehow incompetent. And they may be true, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you're weak. It may mean that you may, and I don't know if it's the same thing, but not as strong in the area. Or it may mean that you have some areas of growth. You know what I mean? I think sometimes people take that and then they, that's, it becomes a hurdle or an obstacle and they never try to get over it. You know, so I think starting off the conversation, I think that's really huge. A lot of people or I think that, you know, there's a, a large number of people who think that, you know, failure is a sign of weakness. And the reality of it is it is so far from the truth. It's and it's information. Now, you know where you need to work. So that's where I want to start with right now. Yeah, that, that is that is really good. And I agree with you 100 percent. I think too many times our emotions get involved. Um, and when we do not achieve the level of success that we had in our mind in the beginning, we get discouraged. We start feeling down and start looking at ourselves in such a way that does not allow us to view failure as more of an opportunity to go along with what you're saying. For me, when I look at this particular question, I look at uh, I believe some of those beliefs are centered around the notion that failure is a sign that I'm not doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Mm. And, and so when we go through any hint of failure and we kind of meet that resistance, it's almost as though when that resistance shows up, it makes me feel like I'm doing something that I'm not supposed to be doing. And that gives me permission to quit. So tying that to what you were saying, sign of weakness, you know, oversaturation of emotions and the midst of failure, which now gets me to the point to where I don't necessarily want to try again because I now fear failure um, or another degree, another layer of failure. Um, and, and I think that's one of the things that uh, that we struggle with. But when it comes down to reframing it, if we look at failure itself as, like you said, information, what is it teaching me about me in this current moment in time? Well, if I can get the information from the environment based upon the level of failure that I'm experiencing and make, like we talked about a few weeks ago, a few months ago now, make little micro adjustments and keep trying and then make another mm -hmm. micro adjustment and try again and make another micro adjustment and try again. Then what I'll find is that I get closer to success. And then maybe the problem that I might incur on the way is that success was never really what I had in my head, especially if I don't have the type of experience that goes along with deeming to be successful. 
I'll use this right here as an example. I remember when we talked about it in the beginning, we talked about, you know, doing this, you know, not necessarily Coach's Corner, but just doing YouTube, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, podcasting on YouTube and all that other great stuff. And we kind of had in our mind what success was. And I don't know about you, but I kind of had to reframe my image of success. It's not that I lost that original conversation we had back then, but it's like, you know what? Success is, you know, recognizing at one point in time I was camera shy. And now I look forward to being in front of the camera, sharing in conversation with my brother. If I stop right there, for me, that is success. Success is being able to get on here, share conversations with my brother, the consistency coach, share a conversation with the most exciting chat that you're going to find on YouTube, share conversations and relaying some of that information like he talks so, so greatly about, relaying that information to people so that the younger generation can grab this information and apply it right now so that they don't necessarily go through the levels of failure that we may have incurred in our younger years. In my mind, touchdown, success, right? Now, anything after that is icing on the cake. And that's how I learned to reframe it. Like, what is the ultimate goal? Like we talked about in the beginning. For me, the ultimate goal is the people, right? Mm-hmm. And, you know, Brother Martin over here, the chat, and the people who are learning from this, the, the, these, informa- these conversations that we're having. That is success for me. Anything that comes in addition with it is just icing on the cake. And if I look at it from that perspective, one, I relieve the pressure off of me from expecting something to happen that's outside of my control. And then two, I assume responsibility of the things that I can control. Me, getting in front of this camera, not only just talking, but having something significant to say that can impact somebody else's life, and then number three, number two, just enjoying the conversation with you and the people in the chat. To me, that's the way that we can reframe it so that success can be available. Yeah. Um, I wrote something down. I kind of want to go back to it. <clears throat> I, I initially thought about it in my response, but then when you said it, I thought about it again. So it's like, you know, how you said it could be a sign that I'm doing something um, I'm not supposed to be doing, right? So how do I know that? And then even with me, with the sign of weakness, like how do we know when is that point to where, you know what, I should let it go? You know, um, maybe I really am weak in this area. You know what I'm saying? Versus just saying, oh, well, I'm not weak. You know, being honest about, who you are and exactly where you are, you know? So when I say, if I was in the audience right now, I could see myself or someone a few years ago asking the question, coach, you said I'm doing, how do I know pretty much? How do I know if I'm doing something I'm not supposed to be doing? You know what I mean? I'm failing because maybe this is not what I'm supposed to be doing. Maybe I am supposed to be doing something else. So how do I know when that time comes? That's a good question. I think a lot of times what we do, especially when we do a thing, and you can you can attest to this, when we do a thing, we are the individual doing every little thing that equates to the outcome that we're trying to achieve. Well, it may not necessarily be that you're supposed to be doing every little thing. Sure, you do every little thing in the beginning so that you can get the experience with doing the thing so that you can understand how difficult the entirety of it um, may be. That way, when you find somebody to help you do that thing, you appreciate that somebody that much more. I think the question that you ask is a great question. Number one, does it fall within the skill set that you possess? That's where I would start out. Like, do you possess the skill set of that thing? If not, then have you done the necessary research, the necessary study, the necessary practice to be in a position to action the thing to the level of success that you're trying to do? If you just decided to pick it up and say, oh, I'm going to be a successful YouTuber and just you've never done it before in your life and you're just going to just go at it full bore, well, you may experience some failure. And that failure is trying to teach you some lessons. But here's the deal. The success gap for where you're trying to get to and the failure gap from where you are may be so vast that it becomes demoralizing for you. So maybe you need to take a step back and go with, you know, by the numbers. What is the first thing I need to know? What type of equipment do I need to have? How do I hook this stuff up? How do I do all this? You know how it was in the beginning when we first started podcasting. And I'm only using that as an analogy. Yeah. <laughs> when we first started podcasting, it was like, oh, man, I got to hit 
the live button and the and the intro button at the same time. Like, how do I do that? Like, what's the what's the variance? And so in the beginning, we went through that mental jousting that we had to go through to find out like if I hit the live button, there's like a one second delay before I can hit the play button as well. And so within the scope of doing it, now you understand through experience of trial and error where you can accept some risk at. It's different when you're doing a recording though, because mm-hmm. as soon as you hit the record button, actually game's on. So yep. it, that's that's the difference. And so you have to gauge within yourself, where does my skill set lie? Do I have the necessary skill set to do this thing? That, that, that may not necessarily say that you're not supposed to do it, but maybe you tried to put the wagon before the horse. So take a step back, analyze where I am, ask myself some very difficult questions and demand a response. Once you do that, then you can determine whether or not I am in the space I'm supposed to be in or do I really need to go back to square one without skipping everything else and thinking that I can figure it out. Because you know how we do. We are buy mm-hmm. something and it come with instructions. We'll take the instructions, toss them in the corner and try to put it together. Next thing you know, we got like 15 screws over there and the screws, like it looks like it's supposed to work, but the screws over there, like no, yeah. it's going to fall apart as soon as you use it. So mm-hmm. I think to where I love your question and I think it's a very valid question for people who are listening and for us as well, because there are going to be things that we're venturing into as well. And in our mind, we know what success looks like to us, but there has to be some things that the environment must prove to you in order for you to achieve the level of success that you want to get. So long response, but the more condensed one, don't be so quick to give up. Maybe you need to analyze where you started from before you throw in a towel. Again, is it within your skill set? If it's not and you really want to do that thing, go back and get the proper knowledge that you need in order to get to the point of execution. And you may be felling too because maybe it's not within the scope of your purpose or what you should be doing. You know, I think that for me, there have probably been some things um, that I've done that didn't work out. And I was like, dang, why this didn't work? I really wanted it to work. But then after coming off of that and then going back and assess the situation or reflect on it, I was like, you know what? That was out of the scope of my purpose anyway. So it was supposed to fail. It wasn't what I was supposed to be doing. So now that, you know, I'm a little older now and I understand a lot more about my purpose, I'm becoming more and more aware about certain things the more i learn about myself i see things a lot faster and a lot clearer now you know so whereas maybe before i may get into something and it may drag on for a long time i'm like man why it ain't working now it's like all right boom just don't fall within the parameters of my purpose so it's an automatically no we're not going to set aside time to go do that but if it is within the purpose of my scope I mean, with the, if and if it is something that is within the scope of my purpose, then it will work out. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So um, I don't yeah, know. Yeah. That, that's that's what I that's what I think. I got a curveball though. Mm-hmm. What if I was to say that everything that you've been through in your life up to this point was designed to get you to where you are right now? Successes, failures incompleted tasks so forth and so what what it, it, i'll give you one you ready mm-hmm. have you ever seen those dudes that used to walk through the parking lot and sell like these little bottles of colognes and perfumes yeah i used to do that i used to do that too <laughs> i did it in i did it in charlotte me too <laughs> i really like no joke I, I, I think i saw an ad in the paper that said did you want to like be a manager mm-hmm. so yeah. you probably saw the same ad bro probably and we probably work for the same dude but here's mm-hmm. the funny part about it. As, as comical as that is, I can look back on that moment and see how that was influential to where I am right now. Mm-hmm. So it really, to me, I don't think that there are any wasted tasks. Mm-hmm. I think I think what we don't do a lot of, we don't do a very good job of doing, is reflecting back over our life and identifying what we learned in those moments that you're actually using right now. And so even in the things that I tried and failed at, I learned something. I learned something about me. And then I have to realize, and and, and I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to tell you something that dude taught us one day. Um, Because a couple of my partners, they decided they was going to go to like uh, 
is it's an outdoor sales event. It's like a free market, right? Mm-hmm. And they was going to set up a booth, and that's what they're going to do. And one of the things he said, I didn't tell not one of y'all to do that. <laughs> yeah. He said, and I never forget this. He said, you got to learn the process before you try to become innovative. Mm-hmm. And when he said that, it, that, like, I don't know what it was back then, because back then innovation was not a, you know, a, a, a conversation that mm-hmm. I was very much accustomed to. And at this time, I might be 23 years old. But when he said that, for whatever reason, that sat with me. And, I, and it stuck with me for all these years. You've got to learn the process before you become innovative in it. Hmm, interesting. So even in that, just that little one thing, that thing, even though I don't believe I was successful at it at all, I still learned something about myself. So I, I, I tossed that in the arena of all the things that were said based upon this first question, because even in your failure, I believe you'll realize that there's success. That's yep. interesting, man. I didn't know you yep. did that either. Yeah, man. Things we learn yep. in the conversation. Renditions is what they called them. Yep, exactly. <laughs> I think there was like, I think it was 20 bucks, but I think we had to pay them like seven. Yep. Something like that. So, yeah, 25. Yeah, but you got, you know, you pretty much got to keep the rest of it. Mm-hmm. You're talking about, yeah, you was a manager, but. You really wasn't. You was, yeah, you was running, yeah, you was managing your stuff. Knock off colognes. Yeah. Yeah, you was managing your stuff. I was out there all day. I think I did it for a week, man. I was like, uh uh-uh. uh. I ain't saying I think I sold one ball of cologne. I think that was to somebody I knew. But it I mean, was I, I made some sales, but my biggest sale, believe it or not, no joke. My biggest selling product was Liz Claymore. Mm. But uh, you know, years ago I man. wasn't trying to sell because here, here's the thing about that. I thought about this. I didn't like sales. Right. It told it told I learned then that I did not want to have to sell stuff to people like mm-hmm. car salesmen. I learned that then I was like, I don't want I don't and I don't want to work on commission. Mm-hmm. Right. However, comma now that I'm older and in the entrepreneur space, mm-hmm. that is something that you have to do is sales. Right. But you see what I'm saying? So like mm-hmm. that situation didn't help me it hurt me you know what i mean because it turned me off against sales now and i hate sales and now i am only so far in my life because i don't want to do the selling part so the only way to get away from selling the part selling especially in initially is you have to pay somebody to sell for you then that's a way there's a way that, that is a way that is a perspective Okay. Here's the perspective that I learned over the years. The reason I didn't like sales back then, I'm not trying to paint the picture like I was an awesome yeah. person, right? Um, the reason I didn't like sales back then, because I was selling through the lens of a consumer. So I was mm. a consumer selling a product, and in me selling that product, I was viewing, I was projecting, right? I was projecting my thought processes on somebody else and automatically making the decision for that person. And so when I approached them with said product, I did mm-hmm. not, I wasn't relaying confidence. I wasn't relaying comfort to them. So I didn't like selling. Mm-hmm. I did it, but I didn't really like it. Only because no one ever kind of helped me to understand a sales mindset. And a sales mindset is not what we know as a used car salesman. Right. Those are like headhunters, headhunters and sharks. Mm-hmm. That's one thing. But really, the true nature of sales is to create so much value in the thing that you're selling that people want to buy. It. So it's not really you selling it to them. It's you offering them the opportunity to buy. it. That was the yeah. thing that it taught me when I went, when I started thinking about it, like, wait. I didn't like selling because I was a consumer. Yeah, that's the biggest Thing and I know we kind of got up, got off on a tangent on this. That's good. Like, we are reevaluating and adjusting goals. Exactly. That's what I was getting. <laughs> and it's not, it sounds like we got off on a tangent here, but yeah. we're right on spot because that's yeah. all about reevaluating and adjusting. Mm-hmm. That's what I had to do. I had to reevaluate my perspective of selling, and then I had to adjust the way I approach it. So instead of, because you know how it is, like you, it, it's kind of like how you view the stock market: mm-hmm. you buy low and sell high. Yeah. And so as a consumer, you want to buy low to get the most 
for what you are purchasing. Mm-hmm. That's kind of like the way until you learn a better way. As an entrepreneur, you can't afford to do that. Yeah. Because if, as an entrepreneur, whatever you're selling, I'm buying it. That's just that's just it. Especially if, especially in the realm of support, if you're selling something, two things I need to know that you're selling something. I can't. Don't leave it up to me to research the fact that you're selling something. I'm, I'm yeah. going to say it that way. Because if I have to research it, like that's far more difficult. Make it become available, right? You have to put yourself to such a degree. You have to put yourself out there to such a degree that the person who is looking to buy from you, for, uh, buy something from you, you're easy to find. That's for starters. So no one should have to dig, go down a rabbit hole to try to find out that you're selling a product. That's number one. Number two, in the readjusting or the reevaluating of my mindset and then adjusting of the way that I see my goals, I realize that it's more important to put so much value in the thing that once someone's seen it, not only was it something that they needed, whether or not they realized they need it now or not, but it's so much value in it that they would think of themselves to be crazy not to buy it. So all of that. <laughs> <laughs> What would happen if instead of seeking a setback, of seeing a setback as a stop sign, we viewed it as a detour guide, a detour guiding us toward a better path? Mm. It's easy, man. What would happen is you would probably grow. You'd probably have better understanding. Um, Just to name two, right? So if so let's be let's be transparent training for the marathon got four days a week i gotta run so i gotta run on monday run on wednesday run on thursday long run on saturday if there is a setback say for instance i hurt my ankle right that's a, and i can't run for two weeks right that is considered a setback in my training so now for two weeks i'm going to miss a total of eight runs so now that i've set it back i have to detour i have to make an adjustment right so now what i have to do is i had to go back and look at my training plan maybe i can't go back and start exactly where I came, where I, where I left off, maybe I have to ease back into it, depend on how severe the injury, the injury was right. And then what happens after that is I can still get to my goal. You know, it's just a setback. It's not the end of the day. You know what I mean? I can go back in my mind and be like, bro, you already did this for 10 weeks. You can keep going. So you can use mindset you can use self um self motivation um self talk you know different things like that so i think that you know if nothing else we can grow from it and then you know changing is is part of it you know even looking at this as a road map me and coach we driving along the way we like Thelma and Luis we going somewhere we heading here and all of a sudden boom a road is out well we got to detour we got to figure out a different path to get to us, get us where we need to go. So that's what I got to say about that right now. I love it. Uh, uh, and you kind of went down the analogy I was about to use, by the way. Map. I, uh, yeah. Oh, it's an easy one for a map. It's yeah, absolutely. easy. <laughs> I hate big city traffic. Oh, man. It, it really, like, I don't know what it is. It's like, I think I'm a pretty patient person. I also think I'm pretty calm. Mm-hmm. Until I get in big city traffic, it's like the most uncomfortable place for me. So if on the GPS I see like an extension, a long red line, I'm looking for an alternate route. Sometimes you don't necessarily know that it's that until you get right up on it. So then you have to wait it out. But then the first detour I can take, I opt for that detour because it kind of gives me the opportunity to bypass some of this traffic. Well, a lot of things in life, um, you know, we may encounter going down the wrong path and realize the path that we went down may not necessarily be the right path. So then we have to backtrack and then go back to the point to where we have viable options. Once we backtrack to that 
point when we have viable option, we assess the situation, identify the best option, take that option, then it takes us further along the way. I think that's kind of like how life is in general. There are some things that you're going to do to where it's like, nope, that didn't work. Nope, that didn't work. And then sometimes you may feel like you want to abandon, you want to abandon it altogether. I think in the long run, when we look at it, instead of viewing that we've wasted so much time doing this thing, we wasted so much time with this person or whatever the case may be, look at the lessons that you learned and how much further you are along at that particular stage in your life. Because if I had not gone down this path, then I would not have learned the lesson that this path was destined to teach me. But in essence, this question is a question of having a fixed mindset. Because if I only have one mindset, if I only have one way of doing a thing and, not, and don't exercise any version of mental agility in the midst of doing this thing, if it doesn't work the way that I want it to work, then I don't have the adaptability necessary for me to adjust what I'm thinking. So I quit. So this is really a question that taps into the notion of mental agility and a growth mindset. We have to have a growth mindset if we start a thing so that we can recognize that there might be more than one way of doing this. My way may not be the best way. So let me solicit the advice of other people. The thing that gets me, bro, is that when I solicit the advice of other people and they depend on my, my feedback, they, they depend on what it is I want to do. Well, no, if, if, if I got to tell you, like, I should be able to tell you what I want to do. But if I tell you the details behind what I want to do, then that's going to pigeonhole you and you're going to attempt to give me the feedback based upon what I said I want. But if I just tell you the overarching thing, like, hey, I want to do this. Now, what are your thoughts? What, what, what comes to your mind when I say I want to do this? Then you'd be like, uh, well, how do you envision doing it? Well, like this. Well, how do you think you want to do this? Well, like this. Well, how many different ways do you? Well, like this. What resources want to use? Well, like this. Well, if, really, if you think about it, I just gave you my entire plan. So now the only thing you're going to do is take that up and throw it in the pot and mix it up and say, voila. Well, that's the same thing I just did. I don't want to give you the details of my plan because I want you to be creative in your own minds and give me your perspective on how you see the best way to do it. So now from there, I have your way of doing it. I have this person's way of doing it. I have that person's way of doing it. And then I have my way of doing it. And then I can look at all of these different ways of doing a thing and then come up with the best way of doing it. And that's going to be the route that we take. I think that's important. That's the value of people that you surround yourself with. And, and so I just kind of want to throw that part in there as well in conjunction with what we're saying. Yeah, I'm going to add a little I'm gonna add a little kindling on the fire, too, yeah, um, because I thought about everything that you said and, and what we talked about. And I kind of, you know, these are just some of the, the things that would happen. You know, we talk about all these situations. There are there are turning points. You know, there are setbacks. But during the so setback, one of the things that happens is it forces you to problem solve, right? So your problem solving skills get better. Another thing that it does, I'm, I wrote these things down. It forces you to be more creative, right? So create your creativity kicks in some. And then lastly, it's a setback. So now you throw in the resiliency aspect of that, too. So I think even when you have these setbacks, you, you can learn problem solving skills, creativity. You can become more creative and you can have a little bit more resilience in your life based off of those things. You know, I'm so glad you said that because you're right where we need to be right now, because I think. When it comes down to it, one of the things okay, that we the struggle question. with is, mm -hmm. like you mentioned previously, our emotions. Mm -hmm. and, and sometimes because of how I feel based upon my expected outcome versus reality, I may you know, get a little down on myself, become an emotional wreck, whatever that looks like. Sometimes I may pout, go sit in the corner, don't talk to nobody, you know, go out and binge eat because you know, comfort food is a thing. And that's what some people tend to do, right? Well, you know, how might our life improve if we could recover from setbacks with greater emotional strength and quicker bounce back? How might our life improve if we could recover from setbacks with greater emotional strength and quicker bounce back? Man, starts with an R, ends with an S. 
Say it with me, folks. Relationships. You know how much stronger your relationships can be with everybody if you could recover from setbacks. You know what? Man, I got this text from so-and-so. Um, I text them back, but then they ain't text me back. Darn, it ain't that big deal. You know what I mean? You getting upset. That's a little setback, right? Because y'all might have a little squad. But what if y'all can talk that thing out real quick and get to the bottom of it and move on? Right. There's a setback in your relationship. What if you guys can talk that thing out, hash it out like this and then move on? You know what I mean? Man, this is a huge thing in relationships. I ain't going to say who, but usually when there are setbacks, there's usually one gender who usually bounce back a little bit faster than the others. But. We ain't going to talk about that today. I'm just saying, man, I just think people overall relationships can be a lot stronger in this situation. <laughs> I mean, uh, bro, that, that was, I mean, home run. Like, bro. like you are so absolutely right. In fact, I found myself on a, uh, on a TikTok. Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, one of the questions came up was about conflict. And, you know, of course, people view conflict as a bad thing because conflict is terrible, blah, 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 blah. And I said, well, that's their way of looking at it. But what if I told you that conflict is a beautiful train wreck? And if both people go into the conflict, conflict with the intention on getting an understanding and recognizing that the other person isn't the enemy, wouldn't it be easier for us to come out of conflict real quick? Because at the end of the day, the relationship is the most important person in the relationship. So when we do that, it's like, what do we be? What what are we bickering about? Like, let's you know, let's get back to business as usual. You know, let's do the things that we normally do. And, and so I think you're absolutely spot on, because at the end of the day, when it comes down to this particular question right here, I kind of mentioned it previously, but I can't have a fixed mindset when it comes down to conflict in relationship, when it comes down to setbacks, um, as it pertains to any business venture that I'm in or anything within the household, anything within the organization, you know, maybe let's just say we got like a five man team and Mr. Martin, he decided to get sick today, right? Now we know he didn't decide to get sick, he's sick. But in my mind, like he did this to me, like how, how dare he? Like we was on a good glide path and now he, you know, he's sick now. So now we got four people that need to do the work of fire. But in my mind, you know, I have a fixed mindset of a particular thing, as opposed to preparing for humans to actually be human. Some people get sick. Sometimes people get sick. Sometimes people have death in the family. Sometimes things just happen. And so I should have been preparing for things to happen way back here before things actually happen. I think the same thing applies when it comes down to a growth mindset. You don't wait till the situation presents itself and you need to have a growth mindset. You develop a growth mindset before the situation presents itself. That way you have the mental elasticity to bounce back whenever, you know, this thing happened. You have the ability to have the resolve to say, hey, you know what? This situation has presented a dead end. This is what I'm seeing. Now let's make this minor adjustment and let's just keep moving forward. And oh yeah, going back to his point, sometimes oh, going back to your point about relationship, men, it's okay to take her upon her idea. Her idea, if she is postured properly as a help me, her idea is supposed to propel your plan forward. But sometimes we get a little bullheaded, a little stubborn, and say my way is the best way, and then she uh won't stay in your place. No, stop that. Like listen to her. Like she yeah, exactly. Like listen to her. She is trying to help. She's not trying to take over anything of that nature. She wants to be a part of your plan and your vision. There's a lot of wisdom coming out of her. If you listen, you might realize that maybe your original plan wasn't that good to start off with. Maybe when you told her about it, she had these awesome ideas that she was trying to share. And you was like, yeah, I don't want to do that. But why did you shut it down so fast? Why did you like, tell me more about that? How does that actually help, help me to understand how you see that working? Because I'm, I'm liking where you're going but I can't see it like you see it. Like, give me all the details to it, right? And everybody know, like, 
I'm a I'm a functionality dude. You come to my house, everything is functional. You ain't gonna find no pictures on the wall. You ain't gonna find no elaborate curtains on the wall. But here's the other thing that I know. I bet you if I was married, this would be like immaculate. Like she'll come in there and just do all this other great stuff, wonderful stuff, and it'd be like pictures and all that. And don't get me wrong, some men, they're good with that. I'm just not that guy. And I think a lot of dudes fall into the same category. I'm only using this as example. I'm not making this the talking point because a lot of times, not just in the home setting, also in the workplace setting as well, supervisors, you have your way of doing a thing, but you got a whole team. Like why not solicit the feedback from the whole team? You got like I, the example I gave, we, we're a five person team, right? Isn't five heads better than one? So don't get so egotistical to where your little title stands in the way of productivity. Like recognize the fact that all of us together, all of these perspectives, man, we can get the full piece of the pie if we all come together. So I think that becomes the thing. If we recognize that, you know, more than one head is always, you know, cooler heads prevail, number one. As long as you have more than one perspective tackling a problem, then you will get a more well-rounded solution. And if we can open ourselves up to that, not only, not only can we get to a, you know, a better solution faster and have quicker bounce back, but we'll realize in time that it's better that I kind of, you know, emotionally regulate myself so that we can all pitch in and things of that nature. So that's that's just my response to this, man. Yeah, very, uh, very, very well said, man. Very well said. Um, I think in addition to the relationships, I think it also can if you have better relationships that can can that can increase your overall physical and mental health along with that. So it's a win win situation. Like you said, no one should want to drag out a setback forever, especially in a relationship. And especially if we're going to be together. I understand that certain things come up and there's a mourning period, what I'm like to call it when there are certain things that go on, but it shouldn't be forever. You know what I'm saying? Like you said, and like we always talk about on Tuesdays and, and Friday nights, the relationship is the most important person in the relationship. Um, but something you said, you know, it sparked my spidey senses, made me think about David Goggins. Um, and it's something that I have adopted in my life. It is part of my lifestyle. And that is talking about preparing ahead of things. You mentioned that earlier, and that really stuck out to me. Um, I don't want to derail the conversation for this. So um, I'm just going to make a statement about it instead of asking a question. The statement is more so about, you know, I think that that's very important. You said that, but I think it, for some people, it may have went over their heads. Um, not saying anybody here, but just saying that sometimes we don't, we don't catch things sometimes because there can be a lot of other words around one highlight. So I just want to go back and highlight preparing ahead for things. You know, when you do push up, if you get up in the morning and you do a certain amount of push ups every morning, if you're in a situation and you're trapped somewhere and you need to push something off of you, you stand a greater chance of being able to do that because you have already prepared your body to do that physical activity, you know? So it works like that mentally too. When you do mentally challenging things on a consistent basis or even on purpose, when mentally challenging things happen, you, your mind is a lot more resilient to it. So I didn't want to skip over that. You know, I think it's very important that people, you know, figure out a way to prepare mentally for things. It doesn't mean that when tragedy or when certain things happen that you won't or you can't have an emotional breakdown. But I guarantee you, you can, you know, coach told me something, you know, a few weeks ago. Um, he was talking about where we are in our life right now. We kind of can go through the grieving process a lot faster than other people because of our exposure to certain things while we were, um, while we were in the military, you know, where certain civilians may not have. So like I said, you know, find somewhere, you know, prepare ahead for things, you know, because things are going to happen in your life. So. Yeah, no, I, I greatly appreciate that. And, you know, that again, another great segue 
and to identify and leverage strengths. Um, and you kind of, you know, I forgot I actually said that, to be honest with you. But you yeah. see, point. you glossed over it too, yeah. Well, no, I'm talking about, <laughs> about the, um, you know, the grieving. Being prepared for things. Oh, the grieving. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it's, it's one of those things to where it's very hard to prepare for something like that. Yep. But the more you go through it, um, you tend to, and I hate to use the term rhythm, but you tend to develop your process. Yeah. Uh, you know what you need to do individually. Um, and again, depending upon who mm -hmm. it is, it affects you differently, right? Yeah. So now we're looking at, for me individually, in a grieving period, you're looking at me identifying and leveraging the strengths that are within me. Because, you know, God forbid something happened to my mother, that's going to be a lot more difficult than it is, you know, a coworker, things of that nature. But again, mm -hmm. it's all part of relationships. So when it comes down to these things, whether we're talking about something, of, you know, that egregious or whether we're talking about, you know, a failed venture or whether we're talking about something within the work environment that didn't necessarily work out the way that we want it to. And we need to identify and leverage strength. How might viewing setbacks as opportunities to use our strengths create a sense of empowerment rather than defeat? Man, it's not rough, not hard, but man, it's it comes down to like it's like mindset. It's like how we think about certain things, you know. It's that self talk. It's that you know that like I said that that mindset, right? So when when things happen, we have a choice, right? Like I gave earlier with. The example about missing four weeks, I mean, missing two weeks of marathon training where I have two opportunities there, right? I can be like, you know what? I can still figure this out. I can go out and create a plan, adjust a plan, and then keep moving. Or I can be like, man, I'm two weeks behind. I don't think I'm ever going to catch up. You know what I mean? And while I'm having this conversation in my head, the person who's stronger is going to win. So if I'm used to having defeating thoughts in this situation, I'm probably going to tuck my tail between my legs. I'm going to run and I'm going to come up with a thousand excuses of why I can't go out and compete in this marathon. Right. If I have trained and talked to the strong person in my head on a regular basis, then when things happen, when setbacks come I'm going to be empowered. I'm just like, look, brother, you didn't already did it for eight weeks. You didn't already did it like this. You've done this, do this. I can go back to my bag of tricks. I can go back to previous accomplishments that I've had in my life, and I can use all of these things to move me forward and get past all of those different things. You know what I mean? So um, I don't know how to answer it, like, based off of that question. But I kind of answered it how it made sense to me. And I hope I didn't throw it off too much. But but here's the thing. I think you did answer it based upon that question. Mm -hmm. But let me take it back to the relationship side, right? Mm -hmm. And I kind of talked about, you know, we as men, sometimes we get bullheaded and we don't necessarily listen to our significant others. And the only thing they're trying to do is help. Well, just because I am the man of the house, that does not necessarily mean that I'm always in the lead. Mm -hmm. When things happen, we identify which skills, who has who has the most dominant skill set considering the level of adversity that we're facing. Let's just say she has a degree in finances and you know all that other great stuff. She's good with the money, so I'll say it that way, right? I'm good with the leadership and managing and moving people around and things of that nature. Well, when it comes down to a money issue or concern, hey. I'm looking at her. Hey, uh, yeah, what, what, what we got? What, what, what <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So I think from a from a teamwork perspective, whoever has the strength in what will propel the team forward becomes the one that empowers the team. Sometimes we let our and I keep saying it like this, and I don't mean no disrespect when I say it, but we let our little titles go to our head. The best thing about leadership is that you empower people to be great within the scope of their skill set. So if this is a finance heavy task, then the finance individual is going to be the team lead on this particular venture. If this is a supply heavy task, then the individual that works in logistics, they're going to be the one that's the team lead on this particular venture. 
And I think that's where it is. From a team perspective, if I have the skill set, if I have the strength, I look at it as an opportunity to help the team, not as an opportunity to glorify myself, not as an opportunity to beat my chest, not as an opportunity to say me, 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 and me. It's all about how can I help. And then what I do is I use my strength to organize the team around a plan that we are going to that we are going to create collectively. Even though I may have the skill set, right? I may have the 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 necessary skill set to do it, but I use that skill set to empower the entire team. So now instead of you know everybody got their head down and like you said, tails tucked between their legs. Now what I'm doing is I'm empowering the team because now I've given them some newfound strength. I've given them the opportunity to see that the glass is halfway full as opposed to halfway empty. So I think not only you answered the question, but you answered the question perfectly based upon what you said. Um, yeah, I see that. <laughs> so um, with that being said, let's kind of jump into this last question real quick. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's take consistent small actions. And I kind of touched on it a little bit just now based upon what I'm saying. So what I'm going to do is just drop this question and leave it for you. What would the impact be on our mindset and progress if we focus on consistency over perfection and overcoming setbacks? Um, I think it can help. What's the word? Help reduce our level of fear. It can help reduce our level of fear. Um, I think a lot of times people struggle to try to become perfect. You know what I mean? And there was only one perfect person to ever walk the earth. And it's an impossible task for anybody. I understand having the mindset of, you know, perfection as a goal. But I think even people who have that mindset of wanting to be perfect they also still understand that they will never be perfect, but it's kind of like as close to doing the right thing on a consistent basis as possible. So, um, like you said, for, for, for sake of time, um, I would just leave it at, you know, it helps reduce, um, reduce fear. Absolutely. Absolutely. Like Al Pacino said in, in a given Sunday, football is one, one yard at a time. Um, I mean, it ain't a lie. That's it. So we're going to kind of dive into these two, two false questions based upon time. We're going mm. to not do scenarios today. Um, mm. So that being said, true, false. First question. Viewing setbacks as failures rather than learning opportunities can limit your ability to grow and adapt. True or false. Viewing setbacks as failures rather than learning opportunities can limit your ability to grow and adapt. True, ladies and gentlemen. True, true, true. Yeah. All right. So the young man yeah. says the answer is true. He is absolutely correct. I'm when true. You, yeah, absolutely. When you see setbacks as learning opportunities, you become more open to growth and willing to adapt. This shift in perspective helps build resilience and a problem-solving mindset, enabling you to see challenges as a natural part of the journey to success. Next question, true or false? Adjusting your goals after a setback is a sign of weakness and inconsistency. <laughs> Adjusting your goals after a setback is a sign of weakness and inconsistency, true or false? I'm sure like all of them just like, <laughs> What to get that answer? Mm. <laughs> False, but it can be. False, but it can be. Want to explain? The answer is false. Yeah. Um. Sometimes you don't adjusting your goal after a setback. How can I put it? I don't know how to explain it. I just think that it's not always. Time to adjust your goals. Um, it doesn't, I don't necessarily what the weakness part, but definitely the inconsistency part. You know, I remember, you know, when we was at the 
um, zero hour weapons. You know, you shoot the first three, you go down and look, you come back, you shoot the next three. You don't make no adjustments yet. You know what I mean? So I don't know. That's kind of where my mind went. But, you know, I think overall the answer is true. But I do think there may be an exception in there. There's always an exception to the rule. So. And what you said is accurate. So the answer is true. Um, I'm, so, I'm sorry. The answer is false. Yeah. Um, false, yeah. And by virtue of this, because I, I, I understand the question, right? Yeah, um, and from a holistic perspective, the answer is false. However, comma, I also believe that you don't necessarily adjust your goals; you may adjust your process sometimes. Sometimes mm-hmm. processes require adjusting, not necessarily. The yeah. Goal. So I get it. So if you answer true or false, you know both of them are right. Um, yeah. So I want to kind of put that out there. And that's why I asked you to explain it because I knew we, I, at least I thought I knew where you were going and you were yeah. going exactly where I thought you were going to go because I would have said the same thing. This can be true. And mm-hmm. uh, the goal, you got to realize goals are like, um, they're kind of like uh, milestones. So goals are milestones in a direction to that aspiration. So I don't necessarily adjust the goal so fast, but I may adjust what I'm doing in the direction to achieving the goal. If I I need to adjust the goal. I can, but something drastically should have happened in order for me to adjust the goal. As long as I get to the end state, um, that's when I that's when I have to make that difficult decision. So great, great response. All right. True or false? Emotional resilience is only necessary during significant life challenges, not everyday setbacks. I say again. Emotional resilience is only necessary during significant life challenges, not everyday setbacks. True or false? False. False. Service so is false. Very true. It's false. Emotional resilience is valuable in both significant and minor setbacks. Everyday challenges like missing a deadline or receiving criticism can be better managed with resilience, allowing for quicker recovery and a more positive outlook. Mm -hmm. Next question. Focusing on your strengths during setbacks can help you find creative solutions and maintain motivation. Say again, focusing on your strengths during setbacks can help you find creative solutions and maintain motivation. True or false? And again, technical foul on coach. <laughs> true. Absolutely. The answer is true. Eat up. Yeah, we kind of talked about that in detail a few seconds ago. Mm-hmm. All right. Last one. True or false? Taking small, consistent actions after a setback is less effective than trying to solve the problem all at once. I say again. <laughs> taking small, consistent actions after a setback is less effective than trying to solve the problem all at once. True or false? I think everybody got that with it. And, uh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I see. I see both. I see true in a sense and true that yes, being consistent. You know, after you have a setback, you know, it can be less effective. You know, what I mean, than trying to solve all the problem at once. Mm-hmm. Um, but I also can see how for some people, I think it's different difference in people. I think there are some people who's like, you know, there's a setback, boom. I can solve it all at once. I just need to sit down, boom, 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 boom. Like for me, when I had when I have if I would have had a setback, I'm not gonna take small consistent actions after I've been hurt. You know, I'm gonna try to figure out and solve the problem now so I can go ahead and create a plan and move forward. So I think this is true and false. <laughs> but I was able to explain the other one better than this one. You see what I just did, though? Because <clears throat> based upon our response, and, and and I know what you're saying, and what you really articulated to me is not necessarily solving a problem, but developing a plan. Mm-hmm. But in order to get to the plan that you developed, you actually took, and you take incremental steps to get there. Like, case in point, like you and I have a a a a traumatic setback in our lives. You and I both share in that. 
right? And during mm-hmm. that time frame, after that event, we didn't just jump back into the frying pan. There were some yeah. things that we had to do to kind of mm-hmm. rebuild ourselves and work on self in order to get to the place where we have this this thing within us, this and this regulation, this emotional regulation, this clear understanding, a, a more uh, a more level head on our shoulder at this point. But it didn't just happen overnight. It yeah. took doing this, and it took doing that, and it took doing this, and it took doing that. And all of that was incremental steps in the direction. It didn't necessarily change the goal, right? But it was moving forward. So when you look at it, taking small, consistent actions after a setback is less effective than trying to solve the goal. In my mind, if you take the words um, less out of it, it's and change it to more, it's more. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Maybe that might, that might look at that. I don't know. That's all right. That's all I right. I forget now. No, no, no. You did. <laughs> you did. <laughs> hey, it happens to the best of us at times. Yeah, there you go. All right. That being said, that takes us to this awesome segment of the show. I got it. All right. Very good. All right, ladies and gentlemen, my actionable advice for the week is this. All right. So at the end of the day, whatever goal, whatever journey you are on, you are going to have a setback. If you're watching this and you're over the age of 18, you have probably had some sort of setback in your life, whether it was in school, whether it was a grade, whether it was a teacher, whether it was a team you didn't get to be on, you had a setback. The things about setbacks is for most people, you're going to continue to have them your entire life. You know what I'm saying? Um, So what I want to say is that even though you, or while you are on your journey, while you are on the path, understand that you are going to have setbacks. My actual advice is this, stay consistent, stay consistent, just stay in the freaking fight, right? Things are going to happen. And like we talked about earlier, the more you go through things, the more resilient you become, the more mentally resilient you become to things that life throws at you. So my actual advice for this week is nothing more than when things happen and setbacks happen, stay freaking consistent. That's it. I love it. I love it. My uh, my actual advice is this. Go back through this video. Listen to how we articulate each stage along the way, along the path of this conversation. I submit to you that it doesn't matter what you're going through. You need to ensure that you don't have a fixed mindset. I love the power of consistency, but being consistent on something that doesn't serve you well would end up having you to yield a result that's not going to serve you well. So sometimes what we need to do is change the thing that we're thinking or change the perspective in which we're thinking about a thing, just like we talked about previously. We have to kind of change the way we look at things in order for those things to actually change. If I can look at a thing and my perception of success is one thing, that this is what the environment is telling me, then maybe the success metric needs to be massaged so that it actually reveals what true success is and not temporary success. Too many people deem success based upon money, monetary value. Money is not the mark of success. Money is the mark of what society says success is. True success is all about having great relationships with great people adding value incrementally along the way. So the question that I have for each and every one of you out there, when you look at your life and you take inventory, number one, do you have great relationships? And I'm not talking about having great relationships just because the people that you're in relationships with are great. I'm talking about having great relationships because not only do you view them as great people, but you are number two, adding value to the people that you deem as being great people. Right. To me, that is the mark of true success. You really want to get after it. You really want to understand your calling. You really want to understand what purpose is designed to do. 
Purpose is designed to put you in a community of like-minded people. Calling is the thing that you do to serve those people. So my question is, and, and, a, and it goes to the actual advice, the question that you must answer for yourself is how am I serving the people that I know, love, and care about? Another awesome did, show. Brother. Yeah, man. We, we did. It, Another awesome show. Yeah. Um, as always, bro, I, I love your responses. I mean, you add so much value to these conversations. And I'll be the first person to say, I couldn't do it without you. So again, <laughs> just based upon everything I just said, you are a person of value. You are an awesome person. And I want to pray that I add value to you and these awesome people who show up every week to support us on Coach's Corner. Anything else you want to share with the people? I'm sorry, you about to say something. Yeah, man, the, um, the feeling is mutual, man. Always, um, like we started off the show, man, it's always great to be here each week and having these conversations, man. I just hope that, you know, the people listening, you know, that they get something from it, you know, and I just want to reach out to them and just say, if there's ever, you know, there's a show topic or you want us to talk about something, you know, feel free to, to shoot us an email or contact us or something like that, because, you know, we have these conversations um, for us, but you know, the intent behind this podcast and the YouTube channel was, you know, to give people the, some of the information that we've learned. So you guys may, it may help you not go through something that we've been through or either, you know, even, you know, the questions that you guys ask in the chat, in the, in the chat, those are valuable too. You know, we learn from you guys as well. Cause everybody on this show, on this panel, in the chat, who's watching, everybody has their opinion or their perspective about something and all perspectives can be valuable to the overall good of what we're trying to produce over here. So, um, thank you, you know, thank the chat, you know, for, um, for hanging in there with us, you know, we're on episode 20 something. I think we're on I think 28 now, 29. This episode's 29. Oh man. Yep. Episode 29. So mm, mm, mm. yeah, I man, we're about to hit 30. I love it. I will add to what you're saying, just one little snippet as well. I, I love the fact that you extended the, uh, the um, extended the invitation, I couldn't get it out, that you extended the invitation for them to ask questions, want us to continue in conversations about certain mm -hmm. things, um, because I am 100% on board with that sentiment. I will also say, listen, we are coaches. If you want a one-on-one, -on -one, book some time with us. That's what we do. Like we, mm -hmm. like the purpose of coaching is to propel you, right? Not to coddle you, I'm be honest with you. It's to skyrocket your advancement in the direction that you're trying to go. So that's the thing. We're not gonna do the work for you, right? What we're gonna do is put you in a position mentally and become accountability partners for you so that you can see your level of success at an expedited rate. That's the key. But that all depends on you. So if you really want to understand how that really works, like get on our, like look in the show notes, get on our calendar. Um, and, and, and I tell you what, do it like this. If you want to book time with him, you know, make sure that you put that in there in the notes when you uh, get on the calendar. And I'll make sure I pass it on to him. But that's what we do. That's what Coach's Corner is all about. We don't say it often, right? We don't say it often enough. But we really want you guys to understand we are here to serve. That's what we do. So. That being said, man, uh, again, another great show. I greatly appreciate you. We greatly appreciate you guys in the chat. Share the information that we just talked about as well. Don't just limit it to this circle. I know people, I know you guys appreciate it here. We appreciate <laughs> you having here. But stop being selfish and share, yeah. it. <laughs> share it. Invite yeah. some people. Invite some people Absolutely. to participate. Yeah. So listen, y'all have a great rest of your evening. Um, and, and enjoy yourselves, man. Love on somebody who you love. Let them know that you care about them. And uh, we will see you guys next week, same time, same channel here on Coach's Corner, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time every Tuesday. Until then, let the best version of yourself be a blessing. To